Job chapter 36. <laughs> Man, I don't know if I, I don't think my heart could take it if I was all the way back, back, in, back in chapter 1. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's true. I'll just have to finish teaching the rest of it to my three friends I have on the front row. <laughs> We've got, them, we've got them in case we need them, so I don't get lonely. Um, we left off at verse 17, and I, and I, I said uh, at the beginning of this chapter, and we've still got a few verses to go, that um, Elihu's going to start speaking on God's behalf. In other words, he's just going to start glorifying God, and he does a really wonderful job of it. And I'm thinking this might have been the, the, the approach they should have come at you know, sometimes, you know, you could just beat somebody to death with their sins. But sometimes when you just glorify God or you just talk about the Lord, how wonderful He is and how amazing He is and how wonderful the Bible is, sometimes that has more of an impact. I mean, I'm not saying don't go after their sin. You should. But, you know, in this case, look how many chapters have gone by that they've gone after Job, yet they haven't been able to pinpoint nothing. So I think... Um, Elihu realizes that because he's starting to just drone on and on about the same thing the other three were droning about. And so he changes uh, tactics, if you will, and, and, and rightly so. And I, like I said last week, it's, it's always a good time to glorify God, um, to talk about Him. And usually when you glorify God and you speak about God and you uh, show how righteous and holy God is, that in itself is a con personal condemnation. Uh, you, you realize that you don't, there's no way that you stack up against God. So we're not there yet. We've got about five verses before he begins um, on, on God's side of the thing. But he's still going to give it one last try at calling Job just about every wicked name in the book. Okay? In verse... Uh, and, and by the way, verse 17 to 21 we're going to read here. Um, if I had to apply this to the, uh, the tribulation, it indicates as someone who has sold out and took the mark to avoid affliction. Now, I don't know how the world Elihu's tried to apply this to Job, because if anybody's afflicted, but he's trying to say that that came from God, that Job compromised and is a hypocrite. If there's one thing that Job is not, it's a hypocrite. He's not a hypocrite. So anyway, here we go. Verse 17. But thou hast fulfilled the judgment of the wicked. Judgment and justice take hold on thee. Because there is wrath, beware lest he take thee away with his stroke. Then a great ransom cannot deliver thee. Will he esteem thy riches? No, not gold, nor any, or nor all the forces of strength. Desire not the night when people are cut off in their place. Take heed, regard not iniquity, for this hast thou chosen rather than affliction. So now let's go back up to verse 17 and let's go through here. Uh, we'll make application to Job. We'll make application to the tribulation, which is what this is, a, if you want to say, a parable of. But it says, thou, uh, But thou hast fulfilled the judgment of the wicked. Judgment and justice take hold on thee. And if you look at verse 13, he said there in verse 13, if I turn over there real quick, he said, But the hypocrites in heart heap up wrath, and they cry not when he bindeth them. They die in youth, and their life is among the unclean. So this is the hypocrite in heart of verse 13 who fulfills the judgment of the wicked. And that's what he's accusing Job of, that he is in part and parcel with the wicked. Well, we know that's not true. Job's got his problem of self-righteousness, but hooking up and being in, in cahoots with the wicked, he is not. And more, this more applies to someone in the tribulation who is going along with the program. And you, you know, there, there are so many people like that. They think that they're free thinkers. They think that they stand alone, and, and yet they're the first ones to jump on a bandwagon whenever it comes riding by. I tell Christians, don't be too quick to jump on that bandwagon. Be careful. You know, take a look at it first. Consider what's, what's going on. Consider the end of the thing. Um, it's because it's amazing how things all of a sudden just turn, you know? 
I mean, you know, it, I don't get into all the politics of the day. But look at verse 18. Because there is wrath, beware lest he take thee away with his stroke, then a great ransom cannot deliver thee. Now, it's no coincidence we use that word stroke today, talk about something that just literally comes after somebody. I mean, it just hits you. Where you suffer a stroke and all of a sudden, you know, your right side or your left side, is it always one side? No, it could be either one. Whatever side of the brain, if it's on this side, this side. If it's on this side, it's that side. Okay. So you have this stroke and then instantly, man, you've been rendered, I mean, crippled. You've been rendered mindless. Um, so, and he's talking about someone, now, I'm not saying that's the application of it. He's not talking, I'm just saying that's how we apply it today when we talk about a, somebody having a stroke. With God, it's, it's the stroke of judgment on that individual. Um, then he says, then a great ransom cannot deliver thee. So if you think about that today, a rich man, it could take a rich man right off his feet. And not a doctor in the world and no amount of money can reverse that damage that's, that's been done. Now they've got some things they can do initially, right away, that might help it. But having worked with stroke people that have had strokes before, I can tell you that once the damage is done, it's done. And they don't, if, if one side's crippled, they may get a little bit, but I've seen it where it scrambles the brain. It just literally just scrambles their brain. And they're no longer functional as the same person they used to be. You see, what does it happen? It happens just like that. And it, it doesn't matter how much riches they have or how much money they have. If God strikes you like that, um, there's a point, there's a point in the tribulation where a man can no longer be saved. You know, that, the only time that's true in the church age is you draw your last breath. Then you can no longer be saved. But in the tribulation, there is, there is another stopgap or another point at which you cannot be saved, and that's when you take the mark of the beast. Now, I'm not talking about anyone that's in the church age is saved being in the tribulation. Okay? Just make that clear. We're talking about the church is gone, the people that are left, if they take the mark, they seal their fate. And in Revelation 14, 11, and we've quoted this verse for other reasons, but it says, The smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So, now I've, I've heard Dr. Ruckman say some things one time about the leprosy and the fact that it could take, it turns everything white, it turns a black mark, white, but yet the verse seems pretty inclusive that if they take the mark, you know, it, uh, they wind up, um, they wind up in hell. Now, turn to Ezekiel chapter 24, and we're still, we're talking about, um, lest he take thee away with his stroke, and something happens to Ezekiel, uh, no, I take that back. There's a lot of things <laughs> that happened to Ezekiel. If there's one prophet I don't want to be, I wouldn't want to be Ezekiel. Man, the Lord, the Lord made him do things, had him do things that just, they were not only bizarre, but some of them were extremely painful. Uh, and this is one of them. Ezekiel 24, look at this, 15 to 18. Yeah. Also the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, behold, I take away from thee the desire of thine eyes with a stroke. You see the, the word there? With a stroke. Yet neither shalt thou mourn, nor weep, neither shall thy tears run down. For bear to cry, make no mourning for the dead, bind the tire of thine head upon thee, and put on thy shoes upon thy feet, and cover not thy lips, and eat not the bread of men. So I spake unto the people in the morning, and at even my wife died. And I did in the morning as I was commanded. And you talk about a prophet. You talk about somebody in, in total obedience to God. He, you know, God said, I'm going to kill your wife. And you're not going to cry. You're not going to weep. You're not going to mourn. And you're going to put your shoes on because you've got no time to weep and mourn. This picture 
of what is going of what is going he's doing this and doesn't even realize that it's several millennia in the future those who flee Jerusalem men uh, women and children will not make it and it says in one stroke a man may lose his entire family in Luke 21, 23, it says, But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. Here's the, th here's the things he told him. He said, The desire of thine eyes with a stroke. So it was his wife. And then he says, Put on thy shoes upon thy feet. What's that got to do with taking his wife? Because he's got to get out of Dodge. He's got to get out of Jerusalem. And he has no time. He has no time to cry, no time to mourn. And then it says, and eat not the bread of men. Why? Because they're going to be fed manna when they're out there in the wilderness. He says, I did in the morning as I was commanded. And if you don't do what God commands, you perish. Because the Antichrist is going to be, he's going to be coming at him with, with uh, armies from uh, from the north and, and several different directions, trying to, uh, trying to wipe them out completely. To the, we're talking about man, woman, and child. So they have to flee Jerusalem. Then turn to Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. Now, this is that great ransom we're talking about. Matthew 20, verse 28, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life, what? A ransom for many. Uh, 1 Timothy 2, 6 says, Who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. I don't know what the Calvinist does with that, but it says he gave his ransom for all. And they'll say all the elect, you know. But What's interesting is that some of the elect don't make it. So what happened there? Anyway, there's all kinds of problems when you believe Calvinism. You, you can't make your Bible, it won't, it won't make any sense, actually. God doesn't make any sense with, with uh, believing what Calvin taught. Um, but notice that that great, uh, that great ransom was Jesus Christ's atonement on the cross. You say, it won't help? Not if you take the mark of the beast, it won't. Those in the tribulation, they take the mark, that's it. Even though a great ransom's been paid, that seals your fate. Then Elihu goes on to say, Will he esteem thy riches? No. Oh, I'm sorry, will he esteem thy riches? No, not gold, nor all the forces of strength. Okay. Um, riches, riches are not going uh, to matter when the strokes of God are falling from heaven, when the judgment of God is falling, there's no amount of riches that'll make any difference. In, uh, in Proverbs 11, verse 4, Proverbs 11, 4, it says, Riches profit not in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivereth from death. And I know we've probably read... I know I've read that verse at least twice since we studied this book, but you've got to keep remembering that the rich and the poor, the rich are those that take the mark and continue to, to build wealth. The poor are those who don't take the mark and are chased and hunted down and afflicted because they don't take the mark. And so they're the poor, okay? Okay. We got this real crazy idea of what poor people are, you know, and if people that don't want to work are poor, of course they are, and they should stay poor. And the Bible says they shouldn't even eat. And that's how you correct. I mean, that's how you correct laziness. And um, and I, you know, if if you got people living on the street because they 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 think they can, and they don't, and when you offer them something different and they don't want to go, you just take a bulldozer and scoop them up with a tent and put them in the first hole outside the city. That's how you take care of that. They're heartless. No, no, no. They're, they're breaking the law. And if you... I mean, they're, listen, these people are being offered something different, something better, and they don't want it. Like being offered a job? I mean, let's start there. How about a job? Um... 
Now, a lot of people have taken some of these verses, like James 5.3. Uh, James 5.3 says, your gold and your silver is cankered, probably because it's uh, irradiated. Um, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. It'll burn you. Um, this is probably has to do with Babylon being destroyed, and the fact that all the gold and silver they've accumulated, which, you know, Rome likes to accumulate gold and silver. The church does. <laughs> and um, when you... When you if you would blow that place up or put an atomic bomb on that thing, it would irradiate all the metal, including the ground. But you know, the people want to get in there and get that gold. They don't care if it's irradiated or not, but it'll burn you. I mean, you just have it in your hand. I mean, it's just going to start, you're going to get radiation burns and radiation sickness just from handling it. But they, they use these verses. It says, ye have heaped the treasure together for the last days. Well, they use that to say that, you know, no Christian should have gold or silver. I've, I've actually talked to, to, to brethren that had some gold, read these verses, and sold the gold. I said, hold now. What you're trying to tell me is that you can't have gold or silver, but you can have gobs of paper. <laughs> I mean, gobs and gobs of paper. You think about that a little bit. Uh, this isn't the tribulation, not going through the tribulation, not saying that maybe it won't make a difference, but um, if you offer me gold or silver or gobs of paper, I know what I'm going for. Yeah, I'll go for that shiny stuff, man. Uh, Dr. Ruckman used to say, get you, get you some gold and get you some guns. I, he used to say that. Gold and guns. Have some guts, you know. And have plenty of God. Amen. There's, there's the key. Have plenty of God. Um, he says, will he esteem thy riches? No. Gold, riches don't impress God. Of course, he, he created all of them. He owns the cattle on a thousand hill. Um, not gold, nor all the forces of strength. Now turn to Daniel 11. When he says forces of strength, we, there's a cross-reference there. Daniel 11, verse 37, 38. And this is about the Antichrist. And it's giving a... Um, it's telling you about him. And in verse 37, it says, Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, okay, nor the desire of women. He's queer. Now you know why it's being pushed. Everything in the world being pushed on us. And, and, and every show you watch and every commercial, it's just pushing it, pushing it, pushing it. Why? Well, the guy's going to show up. It's queer. He got no, he's got no desire or regard uh, uh, no desire for women, nor regard any god. I mean, he'll be even against paganism. Why? Anything that takes away or distracts from him, he doesn't want that. So we're talking about a monotheist. Hmm. You know, the, the, the Muslims pride themselves on being monotheists. They think we're polytheists because we believe three persons, one God, but they believe that we're polytheists. But uh, they're monotheists. So they're going to fit right in here till. Well, till they see the same thing the Jews see when they see that idol go in. Because <laughs> they don't like idols either. The Muslims don't. They're probably going to be more privy. The Catholics will swallow it hook, line, and sinker. Swallow it down whole. Only the Muslims uh, will probably have a fore, uh, forelearning. Um, they'll realize something's not right. And then when that idol goes up, and I think that's who's giving him trouble... Uh, during the tribulation, I think, because uh, he's got somebody pushing up from the south, you know, a bunch of Muslims down there in Africa moving their way up. Anyway, neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. Uh, and it says, but in his estate shall he honor the God of forces. Now, there is no power but of God, and I think that's the reason why that's capitalized, but... He's talking about the forces themselves, the forces of nature, the, 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 uh, the, the powers that are up there, or should I say the, um, the um, what am I trying to say? The spiritual wickedness in high places, that type of, type of power. Um, it says, A God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and precious things. If you go over there to um, 
Revelation chapter 18, you find a list of all the precious things that he holds dear in his church. They all hold the same things dear. The last two things on that, on that thing are slaves and the souls of men. They're last on the list, but they still hold some value to them. <laughs> slaves and the souls of men. Gold and silver and with, pre uh, with, and with precious stones and pleasant things. You've heard the expression, the force be with you. Well, this is that, the, the, the forces that we're talking about here. If with uh, Star Wars, Harry Potter, they both try to harness the forces of nature and the supernatural. And that's the thing that's going to be going on here, uh, the Antichrist and the false prophet. Harnessing the natural forces. Um, he says there, well, I got Ephesians 6, 12 with the spiritual wickedness in high places. It's demonic. It's demoniac. Then in verse 20, he says, Desire not the night when people are cut off in their place. Um, when, you, when you see the word the night, could just be referring to after daylight, <laughs> but a lot of times it refers to the tribulation. In fact, I got interested in, I thought, I wonder... I know we've read this the night before. How many times? It's found 13 times in Job. The night. I thought that was interesting. 2 Peter 3.10 says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works of the earth shall be burned up. Of course, that's after the millennium that he burns the whole thing up. But he says the day of the Lord, which is a thousand years, Cometh as a thief in the night. We are, being in the church age, we are part of the night right now. Why? The sun, the S-U-N of righteousness, has ascended and gone uh, back to heaven. Okay? The nighttime, the moon is a picture of the bride of Christ, or a picture of the church, where we're a light that reflects the light of the sun. And... So we are going through the night right now. Now what happens is that before the dawn, the moon sets, and then you have the darkest part of night. It's always darkest before the dawn. I know I've said that over and over. It's true. I've been out there hunting deer, you know, and I have to get up and get in the woods before the deer start moving around. And I can tell you, man, it's pitch dark! Well, I, go, I mean, I'm 15 minutes before the sunrise. I mean, before the sun ever, you ever even see it, or a half hour. And man, it is pitch black out. And I'm like, why is it so dark? Because the moon set. The church is gone. And it's only a short time, but the tribulation is only a short time. It's less than a week of years. Less than seven years. So, when he talks about the night, he's definitely talking about that. Then he says in verse 21, Take heed, regard not iniquity, for this hast thou chosen rather than affliction. Well, the only way you could uh, take heed, regard not iniquity, is to take the mark. If, or, I'm sorry, that if you regard not iniquity, you would refuse the mark. But someone who does, who's in on the thing, they would just take the mark so that they didn't suffer affliction. And a lot of people, listen, a lot of people will do this. Thank God, you know, I'm saved in this age. I don't have that kind of decision. But when you're faced with, when you're faced with death, and almost certain death, if you refuse this thing, you know, I've heard preachers say this before, that you know, if a guy ain't got enough guts to walk down an aisle and bow at an altar and receive Christ as a Savior, how is he going to refuse the mark of the beast when he knows his very life is on the line? And there's going to be a bunch that do it, praise the Lord, but it seemed like that would be pretty difficult. So he says, Take heed, regard not iniquity, for this, thou, uh, for this hast thou chosen rather than affliction. Well, Job didn't do that. So, and we know that he's applying it to Job, but Job didn't do that. Um, 
Job's being afflicted right now for that very thing he's talking about. The, um, look at Hebrews 11.25. Hebrews 11.25. Interesting, we find this, so it says, referring to Moses, choosing rather to suffer, what? Affliction. You know Moses is coming back, right? <laughs> choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. And that's what this is. Taking that mark, oh yeah, man. For the time being, you're going to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, but it's going to be very short-lived. And then comes the sh stroke of God. Just waking some of you up. Sorry about that. <laughs> Sunday, about half the church was asleep. And over. <sighs> oh, man. He'd slam a book down. Some preacher will throw something at you, so you kind of got to, you know, dodge it, you know. And, all right, look at verse uh, 22 to 25. <clears throat> He says, now this is, where, this is where he begins to exalt the Lord. He says, Behold, God exalted by his power, who teacheth like him? Who hath enjoined him his way? Or who can say, Thou hast wrought iniquity? Remember that thou magnify his work which men behold. Every man may see it, man may behold it afar off. So this is where Elihu begins exalting uh, God in Job's eyes. And Job doesn't respond to that either, but I think Job... You know, I believe he's listening, taking in everything. And it's, it's interesting that when, when Elihu begins this, it's not a chapter and a half later, the Lord comes right into the conversation. Maybe that's what it's about. It's, it's just, we, tend to, we tend to only talk about us, the things of us, instead of the things of God. Preachers are notoriously guilty of that in Laodicea. They'll talk about family, they'll talk about marriage, they'll, they'll talk about everything, and I'm not against it. But they never talk about the things of God. It's always about your things. It's always about this and that and, and I don't know, just relationships. Well, what about that relationship? What about knowing about Him? I think that's much more important. Not that we should negate the other but I think more time should be spent learning about the Lord and less time uh, feeling sorry for ourselves. Anyway, uh, so verse 22, it says, Behold, God exalted by His power, who teacheth like Him? So God stands alone in power. There's nobody that trumps Him. Not even Trump. There's nobody that trumps God. There's nobody above God. There's, there's nobody that God answers to. In Romans 13, 1, he says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. You say, but all the wicked, wicked powers, they're of God. The powers exist because God allows them to, whether they're wicked or not. There is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. If you've got a problem with your power, then get on your knees and pray about it. Go and vote. Ask God to change the, 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 the ruler that you have if you don't like him. And pray for a nation to get right. Because usually it's the, prob the problem is with the nation. Um, what's the how's the verse go? I'm sorry. Righteousness exalted the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. But then there's a blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Huh? This, this nation will not come out and proclaim anything. You read its documents, the, the Lord Jesus Christ is not among, those, is among any of those documents. You say, why? Cowardice. They talk about, they talk about the, the, the principles in which they base their government on, but they won't give it, they, won't, they wouldn't put that name in there. Had they put that name in there, we wouldn't be having all these problems with all these other religions coming in and trying to dictate to us how we're going to run our country. We'd be running it according to the Scriptures, or at least trying to. Now, you know, nature's God, providence, you know, any way to get around the name of Him. Because they, they'll all claim that. Nature's God. That's Allah. 
Providence, that's Allah. But you can't say the Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son, and say that's Allah. <laughs> Allah didn't have a son. <laughs> anyway, I think we should have done that. But, there, but God stands alone in power, and it says no, no one can teach like God. I was amazed one time, I was watching this military thing, you know, how much our military looks at nature and tries to duplicate the things that they find in nature. Science does, physics does, uh, you know, um, uh, who's the people that build? Architects. They're all looking at nature and they're being taught. Many of the weapons we have is because they found some bug that can do this, or they found some bird that can do this, or, you know, and they, or they found some venom from some snake or something, and they're trying to duplicate that. And nature teaches us. One of the verses in 1 Corinthians, and this is, <laughs> this is one of the hardest verses to understand. 1 Corinthians eleven fourteen 14 says this, Doth not even nature itself teach you? And then, it, that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? Huh? And everybody goes, Because what do you find in nature? You find that just about every male of the species is fluttery, flowery, colored, you know, strutting around, you know. <laughs> and the female is plain. She doesn't have bright... I mean, you ever seen a, a cardinal and then see one, see the female? The female is kind of like gray with a tint of red. And then you got this real bright. And he's got that little, you know, that little thing going on, you know. Uh, uh, I don't know if it's a mohawk or whatever. And I mean, it, like, or... or Look at a turkey. Look, look at the tom versus, versus the female. Uh, everything, every bird you can imagine, you look at the, the male and he's just, he's just a... What's the word? Huh? He's a spectacle. He's an embarrassing spectacle. <laughs> I mean, they do crazy things. You see how they, 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 I mean, they're, they're around the females and everything. We're not an animal. But nature itself tells us that, and that's that word shame you've got to be careful of. Don't you dare tell me Jesus Christ had short hair. Because you're trying to say that, sh that something that's a shame is a sin, and that's not necessarily so. In the case of long hair, it's a shame, it's a spectacle. You ever see them Jews, the Orthodox looking? Spectacle. Man, you can spot them out of a crowd anywhere. Why? They look peculiar. And Jesus Christ would have had that long hair just like that Jew did because it pictured God covering the nation. But in this age, it's about families. And the man's the head of the family. And he's saying, nature teaches you that that thing's a spectacle. You shouldn't be that spectacle. You should be the head of the family. You should be the spiritual leader in the family. And because of that, you round that head. You don't have that flowing hair and trying to look like Jesus. Look like a hippie. And there's reason for all that, but you can't say that Jesus Christ sinned or that, and there's a track out, did Jesus have short hair? And of course they tried to teach that he did. It's like, he said he would have had the Roman cut of the day. He wouldn't have done anything Roman. Nothing. Talk about an insult. I would want to be the dude that wrote that track, and I know who he is. And all I'm saying is that he would have followed the Old Testament law, and he would have, he would have grew his hair out just like, and it says, Song of Solomon says, bushy and black as a raven. If you want to know what color his hair was and how it was bushy. He had full head of hair. You and I, and by the way, there's, no, there's nothing that says that I have to make everybody do that, too. The Bible says we have no such custom. We, we just teach the truth. Look, here's what you picture. That's why the head has to be revealed, because you're the head of the family. That's the picture. That's the type. You want to wear long hair? Wear it down to your shoulders. Okay? But if I come up to you and say, Ma'am, can I help you? Don't get mad at me. <laughs> Ma'am, can I help you find your seat? And Can I buy you a razor? Okay. Um, where was I? 
Oh, no one can teach like God. Verse 23, uh, Who hath enjoined him his way, or who can say, Thou hast wrought iniquity? In other words, no one checks on his progress or reviews his decisions. They don't enjoin themselves and, and, and tell God, you know, well, maybe we ought, maybe you ought to do it this way. God does what he wants. And he's, he's the one that's got to be justified and righteous in it. And I can tell you this, don't bet against him. You'll be wrong. When this whole thing is said and done, man, God's going to come out looking great. He's going to be righteous and just and holy and merciful and mighty. And don't look at this thing like, well, what I see, you don't see it all. You don't see everything. You don't see even a fraction of everything. Have you ever had something happen to you and then later on it turned out to be the best thing that could have ever happened to you? Just keep that in mind. It's not over with yet. And that's what faith is. Faith is saying, God, I trust you with my life. I trust you with my eternal life. I trust you with my soul. I don't trust you with my life. And you follow and obey God, even though it looks like it's, sometimes it's a dead end or it looks like it's going to be painful or maybe it is some pain involved. But you follow that anyway because you believe what God says. He says He's doing it for your profit. He says He's doing it because He loves you. But no one checks His progress or reviews His decisions. No one can bring charges of wrongdoing against God unless He allows it to defeat His enemies in the eyes of His creation. In other words, if God does allow someone to question him about his uh, righteousness, and I think that he will. I don't know. I just had that feeling from this verse. Um, there's actually two verses in the Bible. It's quoted from Psalms 51.4 in the book of Romans. I'm going to read the one in Psalms 51.4. It says, Against thee, thee only, have I sinned. This is David writing this after the, the sin with Bathsheba. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. We, we use the expression, uh, I think this is going to clear him. He's in the clear. Uh, be clear when thou judgest. When God's judging someone at the great white throne judgment, he will be clear of any wrongdoing. That thou mightest be justified when thou speakest. Uh, And granted, no, he doesn't have to let anyone bring an accusation against him. But he w I think he will. I think he'll allow them to make all the accusations they want. Then he'll defeat their arguments. I'll tell you what, man, most people, you know, even an atheist. An atheist was a believer at one time. Uh, he was a believer. This book tells you they all believed and then they changed their mind. They knew that there was a God. They could see that there was a God. And then they, they, and then they, uh, they turned on him. Um, and that's where we get verse 24 and 25 says, Remember that thou magnify his work. Well, the work of the creation. Which men behold. <laughs> they see it. Every man may see it. Man may behold it afar off. So you better give God the credit where credit is due. Both in nature and in the heavens. That God did that. And people can tell me, well, I don't, I, don't, I don't believe in God. I believe there's a scientific explanation for everything. You know, I look at them and just laugh. There are billions of galaxies and billions of stars in each galaxy and billions of light years that you could just travel in one direction. Okay? How much knowledge do you think you've accumulated here on this earth? I mean, think about it. Uh, from 1 to 100, you're not even at point 0.1. And you've already made a decision that there's no God. You're crazy. You're loony. You, you need to be locked up, man. You need your head examined. Because you could just... just you know, if you haven't taken a look at the stars lately, you should. If you haven't gone on a trip to go to like Natural Bridge or someplace like that, you ought to go. You ought to get out there and, and just look at nature, you know. And I'm not saying you worship nature, but I'm just looking at nature and saying, God did this. You can see the design all over the place. 
I mean, if you watch all them channels, all them bugs and everything and, and critters and stuff that they, they, you know, they talk for them, you know. They tell you they evolved, but yet it's amazing how suited they are. It's amazing the design of them. I mean, the fact that a frog can be yellow and orange to let the other species know, don't mess with me, I'm poisonous. How's that work? I mean, how did it know to, to evolve into something orange or yellow or red? But, it, you know, see, evolution doesn't. How, how, do, how does the birds know ex the instinct to fly in one direction? They've never been to that place, but they know exactly where to go. H how does that work? How can a bumblebee fly when its weight says that it can't get off the ground? And I've been swatting at them things all day today. And especially them ones that burrow in, you know, that quarter inch hole that I can't even drill one as nice as they can. I have one in my face today, you know. He's already out there, you know. I hate bugs. <laughs> anyway. Romans 1, verse 19 to 21 says, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. Don't tell me you don't believe in God. You know He, he showed you. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. The things that are made declare that there's a God. Now, you're not going to find a signature. You're not going to find any DNA. You're not going to find, this. I did this written in the sky with God's finger. He's not going to do that for you. By faith you'll receive it because your, your, your eyes, your mind should tell you that there's a God and there's a book that tells you that there's a creator. And that's all you need. Now, if you reject all that, he's just going to feed you, he's just going to feed you lie after lie after lie after lie and take you straight into hell for your unbelief. But it says, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. You mean like evolution? And their foolish heart was darkened. And all God does, all God does, same thing he did with Pharaoh, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice. He just kept hardening his heart, hardening his heart. God will feed him a lie. Or he'll allow something, something to feed him a lie. Intelligent design, laws of nature, of the order of things, should convince any sane person that God exists. I, I'm just, I'm amazed at what God created, and it's in a fallen state. I'm just amazed at it. There's some of the stuff you learn, it's like, wow. God did that. And just imagine what it would be like when it's not fallen. <laughs> In Psalm 19, verse 1 to 6, it says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. Day unto day utter speech. In other words, those heavens up there speak to you. And night unto night showeth knowledge. Design. Someone intelligent made that. They talk, we talk about the earth being in what we call a sweet zone. Or I don't, maybe it's called something else, but I thought sweet zone sound, sounded right. But you know that there are hardly any in our, uh, well, there are definitely none in our solar system, and maybe none in others in our galaxy that are even close to being in that type of sweet zone of just the right proportion away from a sun, at just the right size of a sun, and just the right size of the planet. I mean, you realize how rare it is in the universe to find that? Yet here we are. With all these critters and fruits and vegetables and all this, it just happened by chance. Yeah. It says, there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. In other words, nobody has an excuse for saying, I didn't know there was a God. What, are you stupid? I mean, you look around yourself every day, look up at the sky, and you don't, you don't see that there's a God? You don't see the design and everything? The complexity of the human body? Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the, end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is a type of God, uh, which is a type of the, not only God the sun, but it's a type of the uh, Godhead. The three rays that come off the sun. Now, I think I've told you, you got the heat ray, you can't see it, but you can feel it, that's the Holy Spirit. You got the light ray, you can't feel it, but you can see it, that's the sun, Jesus Christ. And then you've got the actinic rays you can't see or feel, and that's God the Father, the invisible God. And it says, which is a bridegroom coming out of 
his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. Every time that sun sets, and I get to see just about every sunset, that there's not a cloudy day, I watch that sunset. From where I, I've got an easy chair, and where I'm sitting, I can look right out and watch that sunset. And many times it's blood red when it goes down. Or very, very bright orange. That pictures, when he left, it pictures Calvary. Where he shed blood, shed his own blood. And then when it comes back up, it can be just as blood red or that deep orange or whatever. And that shows you at his coming, we call that the dawn. The sun of righteousness arising with healing in his... When that sun comes back, it also is going to be a bloody event. Every day that happens. Every day you have that witness. That's why they end up worshiping the sun. Because it pictures his eternal power and Godhead. His going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit into the ends of it and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. Talking about that sun. It's a picture. Every man may see it, man may behold it afar off. Then verse 26, and I'm going to finish with this one tonight. It says, Behold, God is great and we know him not, neither can the number of his years be searched out. Well, I think, you know, behold, God is great. That's a vast understatement. I, I think... How would you put that into word? How would you describe God? I mean, knowing from the scriptures what he has done, what he's going to do. I don't know if you can put it in words. Uh, it's, it's beyond our ability to, to, to voice. I guess all you do is just shout. You know, glory to God, hallelujah, because nothing else can possibly describe how great God is, how powerful God is. And... As far as I'm concerned, how wonderful. I like what Song of Solomon says, that he is altogether lovely. I believe that's in Song of Solomon. Uh, maybe in Psalms, but I think it's Song of Solomon. He is altogether lovely. I love that statement, talking about the sun. Um, now, the thing here is that we cannot conceive of the things God has made for us other than through revelation. Hold it down. Let me see what I've got down here. I've, I've confused myself here now. Hmm. I, can't, I, I can't make sense of what I wrote there. Um, ter, well, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9 and 10. Hmm. I can't figure out what I was thinking when I, when I wrote that, or typed it. In 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9 10, But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered to the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Um, one of the things I'm trying to bring out about this, and I can't figure out what I was thinking when I, when I wrote that part, um, is that when Elihu says this, we know him not? Well, they don't have the Old or the New Testament. They're lacking a lot of revelation that you and I have. And in that sense, maybe they don't know him. Maybe they don't know him as well as they... I'll tell you what, though, I'm impressed with what they know. No more than I do about some things, that's for sure. Um... So they don't have the written revelation of the Old New Testament. It's not been penned yet. But yet we're told in the New Testament, we know this, that we can know Him. Whereas maybe it was, it was difficult to, and I think Job had a relationship with God. I'm not saying that. But we know Him. We are part of Him. And that's, that's, that's where it's different. He's in us and we're in Him. Um, Philippians 3.10 says, Paul said this, that I, may, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. And that is really the goal of any Christian. Once you're saved, your goal is to know him. And then the power of his resurrection and then the fellowship of his sufferings. So the relationship, the power, and then the sufferings that go along with it. And we can know him.
You've got a whole book that tells you about him. We've been studying about him for, well, this is the 103rd, 103, I think, is on Job. 1 John 2, verse 3 and 4 says, And hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. Now, a lot of this is going to apply to the tribulation. Think about that. If they keep his commandments, they're going to know that that guy sitting in the Holy of Holies claiming to be God is not God and is not their Messiah just by keeping the commandments. Why? No graven images. By the way, the Catholics take out the second commandment. Did you know that? Isn't that interesting? Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. They take it out. They take the tenth one and divide it up into two about covetousness. Huh. I wonder why they took that out about the graven image. Maybe they're going to be falling down and worshiping one soon. And also, he says there in verse 4, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. 1 John 5, 20, And we know that the Son of God has come, and hath given to us understanding, that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. So, I think these fellows knew a lot. I think that Job knew a lot. They knew a lot about the nature around them and the world around them and how God was responsible for those things. And I, you know what? If our scientists would just... And there are some, but they're so... They've shut them up and they've kept them so uh, marginalized. And they're, how they do that is this. If you don't believe like they believe in evolution, you don't get the money to do the study. Can you imagine how far along we'd be if scientists just believed the Bible? If they just believed that God was the creator? There's no telling what we would know right now. Uh, and Dr. Ruckman had spoken many times about how believing evolution set us back in science like, you know, decades because of just believing that and still setting them back because it's the wrong premise. Uh, when you start doing that dating thing, uh, you know, the dating game, no, and really that's what it is, the dating game. Um, oh, I came carbon-14 dating and uh, using uh, uranium-235 or um, the K-chain of uranium-235. Some of that may be, have some accuracy to it, but it doesn't, it doesn't make the Bible of non-effect. Now, the Carbon dating thing's got some serious flaws in it. And uh, anybody that believes the Bible would see that right away. Anyway, that being said, God is great, and the scientists know Him not. But it says, neither can the number of His years be searched out. Um, he's called the Ancient of Days, uh, also in the Scriptures. Let me ask you this. Before, in the beginning, God. And this is probably impossible to explain, but God created time. Days, years, hours, seconds. God created time. So what was before the beginning? You say eternity. Yeah, but eternity is not time. I mean, how can you even, can we put an age on God? Well, there's no time. How could we, you couldn't put days and years and decades and millenniums and you couldn't possibly. It's almost like when it says, there's a verse over there in um, Isaiah 57, 15, it says, For thus saith the high lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. It's almost like it's a state of being, not, not a statement of time. You say, well, how long before God decided to create? There's no time. <laughs> There's no seconds, minutes, hours, or days. Well, how long before God decided? When God decided to make something physical, you have space, you have matter or energy, you must have time. And it seems that God wants that to continue 
for all eternity. So, so, you, so here's what we have. Genesis 1, in the beginning, a timeline began. Time began. And that timeline will never end. That's why you can say, I have eternal life. Why? Because you're going to live on that timeline for all eternity. But that's exactly what it is. There's always something physical. There's the new heavens and the new earth, the new Jerusalem. There's the planets and the heavens that are going, you know, that, uh, they're going to populate. Because God chose that. Now, I know that one of the, you know, I'm not trying to get too, uh, too far out, but there's a, an idea going around. I think Larkin may have voiced it. That somewhere along the line, after a thousand generations or something like that, 10,000 generations, however long it is, that God is just going to fold everybody into himself, do away with all the physical, and God will be just like all in all, that expression that's used. And that, that it sounds good, because at that point, there will be trillions of voices. And God will never be alone. There will be perfect fellowship, just God is a spirit. So all this, all these spiritual beings will be all in one, and there will just be one great fellowship forever. But I don't know if I believe that. Because for some reason, God wanted something physical. Yeah, important he places on that physical body of yours, yet you have a soul, and to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, but yet he keeps talking about coming back and getting that body. The hope of the resurrection. I'm thinking, well, I'm already here, Lord. I don't need that body. Well, evidently you do. He wants you to have it. And he wants to have a physical world out there where we can um, grow. Obviously, we'll, we'll be full grown. But I mean where people can populate it, where, where God's government and His expansion it has no end to it, according to Isaiah 9-6. But to put a date on Him? How could you? Neither can the number of His years be searched out. <laughs> I don't know how you calculate that. You say, what is it? I don't know. God is a spirit. I, I don't know what that is. I just don't want to be a part of that. And, and I don't have to inhabit eternity. That's too much for me anyway. I just want to, have, I want to inhabit a mansion, a real nice one, made of gold, living in New Jerusalem, have the Lord right there. You know, he says he, you have the tabernacle, you have the temple, you have the Christian in this age that God indwells. And in New Jerusalem, God is the temple. In the person of Jesus Christ. He's the temple of that thing. It's always getting back to that, that physical thing that's not going to end. And I'm thinking that's what, that's what God wants. That's what God started and that's what he wants and that's what he's going to continue with. So, and if that blew your mind, well, well. Or if that just like, he's, he's kind of crazy tonight. So. Anyway, um, we'll stop at verse 26. We're going to have to finish up the chapter next week. Is there any questions about what we covered? Comments? Anybody got something I messed up? <laughs> All right.